Welcome to Calibrate Conversations, a podcast about embracing God's standard for sexuality. I'm your host, Brady Cohn, and joining me today is our guest today, Dr. Chris Featherstone. Dr. Chris Featherstone uh, is a forensic psychologist, psychotherapist, criminal psychology researcher, and college professor. Dr. Chris has a PhD in forensic psychology, master's in theological studies, a master's in psychology, and a master's in criminal justice uh, in behavioral science, a bachelor's in public relations, and he is a certified life coach. Gosh, uh, Dr. Featherstone, that is a mouthful. I, I'm just blown away by all the different areas that God has gifted you and given you insight and understanding and the mix of uh, theology with also psychology. And you study true crime, uh, like forensics, and that is just a remarkable combination that we need to understand with some of what's happening in our culture today. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, it, it's fun to dive into all those things. Uh, it's funny because uh, just a little backstory of what uh, <clears throat> caused me to endeavor in all those things. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to watch Unsolved Mysteries with my mm. late grandmother. Yes. I love so, that show. Yeah, absolutely. So I was petrified, but I was also fascinated. So it was one of those things that uh, and, and it's interesting. Uh, two shows that uh, was pivotal to my upbringing that caused me to endeavor in the uh, type of academia that I'm in now is uh, Unsolved Mysteries and The Cosby Show. Oh, so, wow. so, yeah. So Unsolved Mysteries was because, you know, Robert Stack had, had the most, you know, scariest voice in the whole wide world in, in the 90s. <laughs> Next week on Unsolved Mysteries. And, yeah, but I was just fascinated at this, the cases. And I was I was a fan of, of America's Most Wanted, too, but really Unsolved Mysteries. And then the Cosby show, I was uh, I was just fascinated because it was a affluent black family. And a lot of uh, black families in the 80s and 90s were, as far as sitcom-wise, were portrayed to be just kind of barely making it, just kind of moving up a little bit, but the Cosby show just really uh, presented an affluent black family and me not being, <laughs> being a part of that affluent black family. When I was growing up, I was born in a, a very poor community in inner city, Columbus, Ohio. And I looked at that and I said, huh? So, uh, <laughs> I could do that too. So, wow. uh, I, I desire to be like uh, Cliff Huxtable. So now, nowadays, yeah. <laughs> I still desire to be like Cliff Huxtable. I'm able to separate Cliff Huxtable from Bill Cosby. Yes, uh, that's good. Know, just, we should some do people that. can't yeah. psychologically make some of those separations. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, yes, indeed. But yeah. tell us a little bit about your story. I mean, on this podcast, we share a lot of testimonies. Just mm -hmm. quickly, how did you come to know the Lord? How did you fall in love with Jesus? How did Jesus change your life before we get to really the academic side of things? Yeah, so it goes back to my upbringing. Uh, so poor community in, in, in inner city Columbus, Ohio, uh, across the street from a, from a, 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 a crack house, um, heard shootings just about every day in my neighborhood. And so it was one of those things that uh, I I was just seeking something better, you know, and, and it was one of those things that I knew that I could choose one path or the other, because in high school, I started to become um, just tempted and I was axed a few times to start endeavoring in drug and drug use. And I, and I uh, declined them all. And, you know, <laughs> years later, that was the Lord you know, keeping me and protecting me and, and having his hand on me. But at the same time, you know, it was, it was super tempting. Uh, I saw people mm -hmm. who were having nice cars and shiny, uh, new watches and, and things like that. And it was very, very, uh, tempting as a, as a high schooler. But the thing is purpose really kept me, uh, focused because I always wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor mm -hmm. growing up and, and that never left my mind. And so I know that if I was going to be a drug dealer, that just wasn't a path that I wasn't, 
I, I wanted to be a doctor. So, I mean, that, that really was something I was really, really fixed on. And so, uh, I started to, I, I was raised a Lutheran actually, like mm. semi churched. Uh, I would go to the, I would walk mm. oftentimes from my, from my house, uh, to the closest church nearby. My brother and I would do that. And it was a Lutheran church and I, I, I received nothing. I mean, I, I, it was, it was the, we were a part of it. We would carry the torches. We would have the white robes. We would, we would swing the incense. We would do all those things. But as far as just teaching is concerned, nothing stuck uh, with me. I would actually keep going because there was a cute girl that mm -hmm. I thought was, uh, <laughs> that enticed me to keep going. And I, I, I ate cookies, a row of cookies every week and drank coffee. And so those three elements caused me to uh, remain going to this Lutheran church, but I, I, I didn't really connect. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a connection there. And so that actually caused me in high school uh, to become uh, agnostic slash skeptic. Mm -hmm. And so um, just my thought of God, it just, uh, God was just, just maybe something and I was just carrying a Bible and I just thought it was just kind of, kind of joking around about it. Just I, my, my view of God in high school was just, he may be something, but he doesn't really have any type of uh, direct influence in my life. One of the biggest things that I think caused me to feel that much hurt and pain, it was, it just really was uh, born. Uh, uh, it was really, uh, stem from, from hurt and pain. My great grandma passed away mm. when I was, uh, entering, uh, high school and she raised me. And so I felt so much just despair and pain and hurt from that. And my view on God was just that he was, um, if he did exist, uh, he w abandoned me and hurt me because of the feelings that I was feeling. And so, um, the, and when I was in my senior year of high school, my junior, I, I went to a college prep high school and I almost got, uh, academic, academically discharged because I was just, I just didn't care about meeting the great requirements. And so I got saved when I was a senior in high school. And so that was actually my first year that I made honor roll too. So my mind was renewed and just my, my, my view on life was different. My, my, I got redirected to uh, my purpose and plan. And uh, I started to hit the books and made honor roll that year for the first time. So that's how I came to know Jesus. Wow. That's, that's awesome. What were some of the biggest influences after that, that helped you grow? Did you have pastors, mentors, disciples, community, a certain church that uh, came along beside you and help you figure out, you know, what's going on in your heart? How do you take this next steps with Jesus and continue down a path of a changed life? So here's the funny thing about that, Brady. So when I got saved, I spent uh, nearly a decade, about nine years, uh, in a church that uh, that I would soon, what I would find out to be was a word of faith church. And so mm -hmm. when I when I when I got saved, it was you know it was it was a fresh start. So my 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 allegiance to Christ was very genuine, you know, personally. Uh, but my teachings. Uh, at first, when I was hearing my teachings, it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, here's this big promise. Here's this sweet, sweet buying this, this sweet deal of all this. And if I just say that I'm going to get it and name it and claim and all this. And so being a new Christian at that time that actually was wanting an, an intensive Christian, you know, and, and, and a new baby Christian for the first time, wanting to know how it is to live for Christ. It's interesting because I actually was hearing those teachings and I was listening to them, but I was in, it was like, I was a college kid too. So I was just like, wait a minute, this don't really work. Like in, in hindsight, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm a broke college kid. You know what I mean? Like, 
this don't really work for me <laughs> that much. Like, cause I, I'm not really, uh, receiving the blessings that, you know, this, yeah. this pastor is telling me that I'm going to have. Nah, I'm, yeah. I'm living off of ramen noodles and, and corned beef here. Like this, this is yeah. what we're doing here in college. Well, probably, you know, having nothing as in your childhood, like that type of theology can be really enticing of oh, absolutely. maybe that's the key to a completely different life. That's how they draw people in yep. and they really prey on a lot of vulnerable uh, people. Yep. But, you know, sometimes God's used those in a stage of our life where it's like we hear some truth. And then as we mature and grow, we realize that it's like, oh, like, but there's some major things off with this. And uh, that's part of maturing to be able to recognize that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so for nearly, like I said, nearly a decade of my life, I was under that teaching. And um, then in, in around 2006, actually, it was 2006, I just it was really pulling on my spirit uh, because I ended up reading the Bible for myself and it was just really tugging me that it's, it was just, I was, I was just feeling uncomfortable as the more I got deeper into God's word, the more I was just feeling uncomfortable with the teachings. And then there started to be some, some wild stuff like the preacher would preach and then people would come and drop money at the altar and mm-hmm. the whole money coming thing that come from Kenneth Copeland and Leroy uh, Thompson. And so basically I was like, ah, there's just a tugging in my spirit that just, it's just, it just started to feel really uncomfortable just going there, just doctrinally. And so uh, what, what really was the tip of the iceberg was I was doing ministry uh, for a long time, I was promoting, uh, I became a promoter and event planner here locally for like Christian rap artists. And I would have a bunch of big Christian rap concerts here locally. And so uh, I wanted some uh, help to, to just really upstart that. And I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't receive the help that I, I just really f- felt impressed. To, I really wanted to do this type of ministry, especially for a lot of the community that we were dealing with at the church. And it was just how I was just treated when it, when that request came it was just really weird and so that just i was like you know what i i actually had an inter- I actually had a meeting with them and i was like you know i just felt led to leave uh and at the end of the of, and, and of the year it's probably about a couple of weeks before new year's eve service and i was like yeah thank you for being my pastor and things like that and new year's eve service comes along uh well i i felt led to leave a new year's eve service and it was going to be amicable i was you know met with them and everything and the pastor basically the 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 short version of his response and he said this verbatim he said well you can leave now is what he told me and i was like Mm -hmm. huh like i'm like i'm trying to be amicable here and like be cordial and he started to say a bunch of craziness and that actually led me away for a moment uh, away from Jesus again, you know, until mm-hmm. uh, into a state of always almost going back to skepticism. But what kept me close to Jesus was the fact that at that time, all of my core friends now, then and now I have a lot of friends and some believers, some unbelievers. But a lot of uh, but all of my core friends at the time were Christians. And so that actually kept me close to Christ because I, I didn't have I couldn't really have any other option to really veer away because the people who were closest to my life who were keep checking on me and all that stuff, those were Christians. And so that actually was God's way of keeping wow. him close to me because I started to dab back into like skepticism. And this is uh, early 2007. And I basically was at that crossroads again in my life. I said, either I'm going to go all the way out in the world because I was hurt by the church. You want to talk about church hurt? That was my church hurt experience. Yeah. Right? Church hurt is the worst hurt. Yeah, and it's, it's painful. Yeah. And it really gives you a lot of disillusionment on, you know, if they can treat someone like this. Is anything that they believe real? Is this Man. Bible that they preach real? <laughs> and I've I've been there myself, and I've walked you know alongside so many people who have been there, yeah. and it's it's really devastating. Uh, yeah. Well, I seen a meme the other day that said something about how uh, you know you can be friends with people you no longer go to church with. We aren't gangs, right. and uh, it's like 
it's like the, your pastor's reaction on when you say that, oh, you know, try to give a nice goodbye. And then there's complete rejection. And really, there the true cards are shown that you're being used and yeah. just uh, uh, you, you see what their actual theology is. Yeah. And it's interesting because the fact that the my, having a core group of Christian friends kept me, uh, pull, pulled me and kept me close to Christ. Um, I was at a crossroads and that was one of those things. I was like, you know what, either I'm going to go all the way out to the world. I was never like a fake person. I never was that person. And so I was like, either I'm going to go out in the world all the way, or I'm going to go back to the church with a different lens. And so, uh, the Lord pulled me and, uh, I started to go and I saw, I, I endeavored back into the church but then I started to dive into uh, apologetics. That's 2007 is when I started to endeavor in Christian apologetics. So. I have pastors and church leaders regularly reach out to me about speaking at their churches and events. If that's something you would be interested in, feel free to go to calibrateministries.com and fill out the contact form. And I'd love to talk to you about what that would look like. That's awesome. So, and now uh, uh, you've been on this journey. I mean, you've amassed so many different degrees that it's really, really remarkable. And you, you know, study like forensics and psychology and true crime. True crime is a huge thing these days. And you talk about all these this true crime on your your YouTube channel. So we'll we'll share that YouTube channel. Uh, but what I specifically wanted to start off talking today is you are an expert in cults. And I, I see this aspect of uh, cults that many times has a sexual abuse aspect and how they draw people in and abuse people. Um, and I think that that's a fascinating, you know, psychological, spiritual phenomenon, how they can convince people to give their life and to be s under so much control of this kind of cult like um you know, mentality. And I see that a lot with right now with the transgender movement. And I know that you also watched, uh, we were chatting about this, um, uh, the Twin Flames documentary. Uh, we're not going to really go into that in detail today, but um, it's this documentary on Netflix with like thousands of young adults who joined this cult and many times like transition genders and did crazy things to be loved and accepted. Yep. And uh, we see that happening with our kids, social media, influencing them. Um, and deep down, they're, th they're looking for something. They're looking for some love and acceptance. They're looking for an escape. They're looking for uh, a way to be who, you know, they're not because they hate who they are. There's so many dynamics there. And you have a unique perspective with the psychological and the um, uh, spiritual and the theological aspects of all of that. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how cults, how people become unfortunately uh, tied into cults. It's usually an adage when it comes to like cult psychology or just cults, cults period, just to, just just the study of cults. Like no one who uh, joins a cult intended to do so. Right. Mm. And that you didn't wake up mm -hmm. and say, hey, I think I'll join a cult. And also, you know, people are just so um, uh, just brainwashed that they wouldn't even to this day. I mean, there's people who are in cults that wouldn't call their cults a cult. You know, what I mean, so like it's like that type of third person effect, like they're they're crazy. You know, what I mean, but me, no, mm -hmm. not not really. You know, what I mean, and then you've got cognitive dissonance that kind of that, that comes in there and confirmation bias, all those psychological elements as well. So, you know, when it comes to something like a twin flames or any any type of major cult, uh, you have to think about just you have people doesn't really matter because a lot of times people think that people who join cults are the disenfranchised of this world, the mm. less affluent of this world, but that's not necessarily true. I mean, when you think of like Richard, uh, 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 Richard Rainier, uh, 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 Keith Rainier, Keith Rainier with the Nexium cult, right? So uh, when the Allison Mack from uh, Smallville, I believe she became a, a, mm -hmm. a member of, of it. So that was more like a executive, like, you know, uh, uh, 
executive type of system. It was kind of like a uh, you're moving up and up and kind of like in uh, status. You know, what I mean, it was it was kind of like that. So you had a lot of people who were pretty financially affluent, but at the same time, it was just this guy, Keith Rainier. He was so uh, available. He was so able to use oftentimes his personal um, being manipulated or uh, uh, having uh, situations in his life where he was abused, things like that. A lot of these cult leaders, uh, they usually are able to, it, there's there's two things. There's there's two really things. There's, there's a bunch of nuances here, but if you think of two phenomenon, so to speak, or two concepts when it comes to cult leaders, it's displacement. <clears throat> so a lot of times, uh, Displacement is a defense mechanism that causes someone to have a certain type of feeling, whether it's anger, frustration, uh, uh, any type of negative feeling, and to uh, displace it onto someone else. And so, for instance, you know, boss yelled at me at work. I'm upset. I come home. Has nothing to do with spouse. I yell at spouse because I'm upset that boss yelled at me. So what happens is a lot of these cult leaders, they're still dealing with a lot of trauma and, and, and pain and frustration and anger of how they were abused or talked about, whether it was verbally or physically, or even observing those things. And what happens is they start to, uh, to amass that type of and pin it up and use it in a way to manipulate others in order to, you know, displace and talk to them that way. Also, there's a concept called reaction formation. That's another type of defense mechanism. Freud really uh, spawned these things, Sigmund, and then his daughter, Anna, um, piggybacked off of these things. And so reaction formation is basically, it's a way of, uh, showing contrast feelings, overcompensating for a feeling that's in contrast of what you actually feel. So for instance, someone who bullies kids in high school is really someone who is just grossly insecure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is grossly feels empty inside. Someone who is like this negative troll all the time is trying to cause people to just come down to his level because he feels so empty inside. So that's yeah. reaction. So it's really a cover up yeah. kind of uh, overcompensating cover up. And, Absolutely. you know, I've, when I was growing up dealing with like same sex attraction and sexuality issues, it was, it was always known that like, the macho guy in high school who was so proud of his macho-ness was secretly, you know, acting on homosexual feelings because, and he had to act all macho yeah. to try to cover it up. And, you know, he was like well, the most homophobic, yep. kind of uh, bigoted yep. type, yep. Um, would bully and make fun of those people as a cover up for what mm -hmm. he was secretly doing. And that's, and that's precisely what reaction formation is. And a lot of times those people who are, just like very hypercritical, you know, towards something, even if, even from a Christian standpoint, when someone, you know, there's, there's things that we believe in scripture, that scripture is, is scripture is the authority that we live by. So the, the Bible is true. So what, as a Christian, whatever the Bible says, I believe. Right. And so, um, but there's also a way to reach someone in a way that's honoring God. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's so there's wise as serpent, gentle as doves type of mentality that we need to have in many of those spaces that when someone I can think of a, a very popular YouTube pastor right now who talks about, you know, gay people in a way that is just so condescending and saying mm -hmm. that they should go to hell and, and and things like that. And I think he made it even an acronym of um of, of of something that was just yeah. crazy yeah so i think i think we know i think we're talking about the same person or we're thinking mm -hmm. the same person and so i'm not saying that this person is homosexual but also i'm saying that that's the type of example of someone who ha may have tendencies 
who, who may have some type of feelings inside and attraction that he's using reaction formation to overcompensate with the contrasting feeling that he that he has. And when it comes to cult nature, that's the same type of deal. You, you manipulate people to believe that you are someone special, that you are someone who should be affor- affirmed, that you are a godlike figure, because truly inside you feel very, very empty and and, and useless uh, oftentimes. And insecure. Yep. And insecure. so you need people to fill, fill something so you're not so insecure. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And we can all... You know, it's not easy or it's not hard to make connections on how many times sexual sin and the sexual aspect is like there's so many insecurities yeah. that are fulfilled or, com- you know, o- overcompensated when we pursue any type of of sexual sin. We're, we're trying to make ourselves feel a certain way yeah. and uh, do something inside of us um, and uh, that can draw us. In. And, you know, with with some of that, you also see. uh so many pastors who have secretly fallen and you know their secrets come out it's like oh wow the, the thing you were preaching against so hard yeah. many times sexual sin or this in the culture or that in the culture is something that they were actually secretly secretly doing yeah eddie long is an example of that so so basically um it's public so you know it, it, I, I i don't have any issue with saying his name so eddie long he was a he was a bishop and he was really really adamant about you know preaching against homosexuality and 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 doing it in a a hypercritical way now i'm not saying don't not do it because again you know we should as as believers um you know because again what the bible says we believe no regardless of regardless of how our feelings (laughs) <laughs> factor in mm-hmm. with that. Um, but at the same time, <clears throat> there is a, a, a biblical way to reach uh, uh, communities that that don't share these type of feelings with you. And there's a lot, it takes wisdom, it takes a lot of prayer, it takes fasting, you know, to, to really reach to these communities. And even from a psychological standpoint, if I'm saying, Brady, you suck. You're horrible. You're a horrible person. You're going to be, a, you're not going to amount to anything. And I think that you need to just become a better person or else I think you're going to die sad and empty. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm sure you look at me like, um, okay, but uh, can you pipe it down a little bit? You know what I mean? And so, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. I think you have to understand that it takes rapport. You know, it, it, it's, it's a lot there's an adage, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? Yes, and, and, absolutely. And, and so that is an approach that we should have as believers. But a lot of times, you know, you have the the the, the unnamed pastor that hasn't, you know, that I was referring to the first time because there hasn't been any public things to affirm what I what I assume. Uh, so I'm not going to say his name, but. Eddie Long has came and he's passed away now, but there has been some some public things that came out for him. And there were people, you know, as much as he was talking about homosexuality in a very uh, just hypercritical way, not not a critical way, because we should talk about a critical way uh, as far as critiquing it and, and, and saying what the Bible says about it. But Absolutely. when you get into a hypercritical way of it uh, and and treating uh, them uh, and treating the community as if they aren't a part of the Imago day. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. That becomes an issue. And that's when I start to like my spotty senses start to come up like, mm, like, I want to talk to you. Like you're the one I want to yes. talk to the one who was hypercritical and someone like an Eddie long, what happened with him was he was super hypercritical about the community just to find out that he was having, you know, little hookups with, with little boys, you know what I mean? And that, mm. with, with, with young boys, you know, young boys. Mm. And so that was, that's just one of many examples of pastors uh, who are pu- from a public eye have that type of uh, hyper criticism. And that's just reaction formation. Again, going back to the cult mentality, stuff like that is super duper prevalent. Cause what happens is Bra- uh, Brady is that three elements typically one of three or all three elements usually are, are huge factors within cults, money, power, sex, 
The, those mm. are three and of the biggest factors within cults. Those are three of the big biggest factors within corrupt pastors as well. You know what I mean? So they, yes, they because that. a pastor can easily be running a little cult that looks like a church oh, or, 100%. you know, and not a full blown cult, but any church can have a pastor that leads out of that type of influence yes. and he wants money, power, sex in some way. And sometimes it's just power, which maybe doesn't look as agrarious as someone who's money hungry or obviously, you know, use sexual sin is obviously really obvious for us. But I think the power aspect for a pa pastor can go uh, so unseen or un understood because it looks like, well, he's shepherding his people. He's using his influence like he's supposed to. He's, you know, it can be guised as Christian influence yes. when it's actually a manipulative cult-like uh, power grab. Yeah. And by that time, you already have a community who's in your corner, no matter what. Right. You mm -hmm. have your congregation and, and tying this right back into the cults. You already have a group who's in your corner to make you feel better about uh, uh, forwarding this propaganda of other people coming in. So typically within cults, the money, the power, the sex, it's usually one or all of those things. The power usually comes from. Uh, a, a form of uh, deception, which is typically love bombing. Love bombing is usually one mm -hmm. of the biggest kind of entry level things for someone to come into a cult. It's usually a love bomb or it's usually a, a, a kind of like a, a big promise, like a, a huge promise. Like, you know, uh, you'll, you'll become uh you, you'll become wiser and, and, and smarter, you know, and when it comes to Nexium, back to the twin flames, you'll find your twin flame. You know what I mean? You'll, you'll have this experience where you'll find your twin flame and you'll, everybody needs a twin. Everybody's looking for twin flame. You're hiding these emotions, but as soon as you find your twin flame, it's going to be an absolutely just euphoric level of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. That's, that's never experienced before. There's this huge promise that they have to reel you in or the love bombing piece as well to, to recruit you in. And then what happens is as soon as you, they start to kind of massage your mind in, then it becomes more of a grip. And so when they feel like they gripped you, then they start to strip you with isolation. And so it becomes, you know, uh, separate from your family, separate from your marriage, separate from friends, separate from all those things. Those types of factors are very, very prevalent in cults. Yeah. And, you know, I also see like that, that happens in just re abusive relationships of, yeah. you know, bringing someone in with this big promise and then keep stripping them away and stripping them away. And they're, you know, always on your side though. It's like you, you see an abused woman who always takes her abuser side and keeps going back to him. And, uh, you see some of those power dynamics of so much control and taking away of what, what she has, her own identity and her own value. And she's convinced how much she needs him. Correct. So that's battered woman syndrome. And when it comes into a cult perspective as well, they're so dependent on the leader at this point that they don't have, they don't even know what the outside looks like. So they're petrified mm -hmm. to experience what the outside looks like. That's the reason why a lot of times uh, even cults go into certain communes. Like, uh, like for instance, when you come, when you, when you're dealing with, um, uh, 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 the, um, uh, Level above human, uh, Apple White, Heaven's Gate, yeah, uh, Heaven's Gate mm -hmm. cult. They <clears throat> same type of deal. I mean, and a lot of false prophecies, a lot of a lot of prophetic jargon comes within cults too. Uh, but he, you know, he was just saying that. <laughs> you know, we're going to go into the next level and they're going to, they're going to come at this day. It was false. And then people started to back out and then, uh, his wife died. And then people were like, huh, I thought she was supposed to be like, and so it was, it was confined to like just a few dozen people. Like people started to go away, 
but he had so much manipulation toward those people that he convinced them that uh, there was a comment that went by and that was the sign of, oh, see, there it is. There's the sign that they're coming for us. And so he had, so he made a concoction and I, and had it, people uh, consume it. And you had nearly 40 people die in that commune, but he was, but he bought like a big house for people to come into, because again, he's isolating and stripping and isolating and stripping to people getting to the point of no longer wanting to be a, a part of uh, affiliate with family, no longer want to be affiliated with friends. Everybody started to look asexual, those types of things too. Same thing with David Koresh, with the Brands Davidians. Guess what he did? He had his own commune. He stripped people from their family and their friends. He had a lot of sex with the people there. Mm. He was a big power, a powerful guy. He even had met messianic, you know, statements and he had money. And so it's, I mean, there's, it, there's time after time after time, you know, even with, you know, uh, uh, fundamentalists, you know, LDS uh, uh, groups, you know mm-hmm. I mean? With, with, with those profit profits, uh, Warren Jeps, you know I mean? That, that's an, that's another thing, bringing people to a community, stripping them from their family. It's that same type of routine when it comes to many cult leaders. Yeah. And people want community and that's what people are lacking is a yep. place where they feel like they belong. And that's what that church should be providing. Yep. And sometimes, you know, in the U.S., church can be really superficial and doesn't look very much different from the world. And we're so used to being so autonomous. Uh, but people are searching and desperately wanting a place to belong. And they should find that in church in a very healthy way yes. uh, and with genuine relationships. But um, I, I, I see that with teenagers so many times who get swayed into a community or a ideology that's just off the rails. It's like, oh, they really want to belong. And it seems like they can belong with these people and be accepted. And there's a, a deep community. And I think we're we're made for that. That's how God made us. But then, you know, sin warps it so much that then we're susceptible to fulfill that in such a crazy way. Hundred percent. I think you brought up teenagers, and I think that's a fantastic, you know, point as far as just the belonging. The 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 concept is called belongingness. A lot of teenagers are at a stage psychologically where they're trying to figure out who they are, anyways. And so they're trying to, they're intentionally a lot of times uh, be a part of communities to feel loved and accepted. That's the reason why people start playing sports, you know, at that time, because they want to be a part of a sports community. They want to be a part of a video game community. All those communities matter because you're a part of the whole and you feel like you are a a unique part and an integral part of the whole. And so as soon as you feel like you're a contribution to something, that's like that's kind of, that's kind of like a, a a nod of approval in a sense. That's the reason why a lot of times when it comes to even uh, really really evil and, and and maniacal groups and things like that, initiations, you know, when it comes to gangs and things like that, you feel like mm-hmm. you're a part of the whole. You feel like you're an integral part. You feel like you're a contribution to things like that. So when it comes to that that type of group, you know, the, the type of group dynamic. Belongingness is really, really important because you feel like you're a part of the whole and you're an integral part of the, the whole. And then the more you contribute to the group, the more you feel like the the one, whoever the leader is, is looking at you and pulling you out and making you special. And so that's why a lot of times cults, people within cults, they have those, they're, they're so privy to do the work just like that because they want to carry the favor of the leader who's by that time already made them uh uh, think in their heads that i am the one that you should serve and worship and obey and the more you do work for me the more you'll curry favor to kind of get advantages so so uh so to speak Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and people are are desperate for belonging and to feel loved and to feel special. And obviously those are all things we can find in Christ and, you know, our identity in him and our value comes from him. And, uh, 
And when we're not finding it in Christ and having healthy Christian communities speak in, that into us, then we'll look for look for it in so many places and yep. become susceptible. At Calibrate Ministries, we have an entire ministry just for parents of LGBTQ kids because we want to be able to shepherd your hearts and encourage you and pray for you and your family as you navigate these situations. So just go to CalibrateMinistries.com and fill out the contact form, and I'd love to be in touch with you about how you can be involved in that ministry. Let's talk about a little bit about what's happening with teenagers these days. We kind of, uh, you know, um, touched on it a little bit. We see teenagers who are so gripped by social media. And I was just reading a book recently on um, attachment and how kids are detaching from their parents at a much, much younger age. And their influence is becoming their peers instead of their their family structure and that that's leading them some really unhealthy places and then you know i see kids you know we have parents in our parents ministry of you know parents of lgbtq kids and uh so many families who are struggling because they've lost control in a you know control in a good way uh, sometimes control is bad but obviously when you have a family at home some level of control is is good and necessary uh they've lost control um their kids have been so swayed by social media their kids who weren't struggling before are now non-binary or transgender or so many different identities uh what is going on there how can we help prevent that? How can we shepherd our kids? And we don't want to just raise our kids in a bubble. They need to know how to navigate this world. But what what are some of the psychological, spiritual uh, phenomenon that's that's going on there? Yeah. So when it comes to kids, you know, a, a lot of times I've done therapy with with many many adolescents and uh, uh, pre adults and. A lot of times, man, even from a study, from a research standpoint, and even from an experimental standpoint as a therapist, a lot of those kids just want a hug. I mean, they, they do. Mm. They just they just want mom and dad to just hug them. Um, but here's the thing when it comes to conditioning uh, your kids, and it really is a form of conditioning. You think of negative uh, conditioning, you think of positive conditioning or negative reinforcement, or positive reinforcement. You think from you think of like a Pavlovian type of classical mm -hmm. conditioning. You think of like a BF Skinner when it comes to operant conditioning. Those are all behavior modification tools, right? So when it comes to uh, a parent, there has to be, I mean, again, parents, that's why two parent households, I mean, like uh, there's, there's, plenty of studies when it comes to that, when it comes to like the Gottman uh, studies, when it comes to Gottman Institute, when it comes to Gerald Patterson, he was a, he was a psychological psychology researcher for a while, as far as just the benefit of two parent households. And, you know, there's not all dynamics. There's not all situations where uh, there are two parent households, but still, man, you got to be sure to keep, to get those kids in some good, good, good communities. You know I mean? It's a, it takes a village in many ways. And even if the, the village is a two person household, it takes a village. But when it comes to, to parenting, when it comes to kids, there's four main types. There's, a, there's nuances within these parenting styles, but there's four like major types of parenting. There's uh, authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, permissive, neglectful. So authoritarian, so you have to think about it in two levels, level of support and level of control. Authoritarian is high control, low support. All right. Authoritative is high support, high control. Authorit uh, permissive is uh, uh, low, high support, low control. And neglectful is low support, low control. All right. So typically I'll have Caleb make that into a graphic and put it on the screen. Oh, so that's, that's an interesting grid. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so when you think about it, even looking at that grid, 
uh, authoritative styles of parenting are the most effective because it has a high level of support and it also has a high level of control. So parents, it's not, it's more than just always telling your uh, son or daughter, uh, they're bad when, and the only thing that they hear from you, from you are times when they have to be disciplined. P kids and teenagers, they soak that in like nobody's business. If the only time mom and dad tells me, uh, uh, here's from I hear from them or they or they talk to me or really speak to me in depth is when I act up. Guess what I'm going to do to get attention? I'm going to act up, right? And mm -hmm. not only am I going to act up, I'm also going to look for a community that's going to accept me for who I am. All right, I'm going to I'm going to find a community that's going to uh pull me in and make me feel special, make me feel wanted. Man, Parents who are watching this, you I'm saying this as a therapist, you do not know how much destiny you hold in those kids lives. It is much more than just a, a day by day. Don't clean, you know, clean up your room or else, which is fine. You know, again, high support, high control. You know, there's there's a high level of discipline when it comes to authoritative, but it's also a really high level support, you know, good and well, I'll be at your games, you know, good and well, I'm going to send you praise when you had good days. There's a, there's a balance there that is essential with raising your kids because if not, those same kids are going to look at school or whatever extracurricular activities, they're going to find ways to gain acceptance or feel acceptance because they don't have it in a household. So that's where it starts. Absolutely. And I, I would like to know that so much of that should be coming from dad, whereas we live in a country where there's so many absent fathers and sometimes they're physically absent. And you see that in the statistics, but even in like the Christian world, they can be emotionally absent yes. where there was a kind of a trend for a few decades, uh, misbelief that's like, oh, it's a dad's job to earn a paycheck and to provide for the family. And then the dad has some emotional walls up and never engages with the kids emotionally. And I've, I've dealt with so many people administered to them who have those father wounds because they had a physically present father, but emotionally distant father. And that's yes. not the support that kids need. They need their dad emotionally engaged, spiritually engaged, discipling them, encouraging them, and you know, not leaving that uh, just emotional stuff up to mom. You know, that's that's not a healthy dynamic. Absolutely. Absolutely. If if you if there was a rewind tape, I would tell the listeners to hit the rewind <laughs> button and play that again because people don't realize it, because of how American society, I've only lived in America, I've studied other, other cultures, but phenomenologically, I've only had the experience in America uh, over the past few decades. And I have seen how much the father is just a financial contribution, but not the emotional and spiritual contribution, and how much that takes a toll and how much that negatively impacts particular uh, kids just going on into their adulthood because they want that at a boy or that at a girl from dad, because yeah. then guess what? You're going to look for it in another man. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you're going to look for it in another man, right? Because Absolutely. you didn't get it from dad because you didn't get that at a boy and at a girl from dad. Fathers should pay attention that that fathers should, should set the standard of how they want their daughters to mate. They should be the standard for that. So if you are absent father, you created the standard of how you want your daughter to mate when they grow up. Someone who's just emotionally mm -hmm. absent is just there to pay money for you, right? You created that standard. But if you are there spiritually, if you're there emotionally, if you have little inside things, you know I mean? My daughter and I, my daughter's six. 
and her, like we, we are just, mm -hmm. that's my girl. Like that's, that's my girl. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's my daddy. Like, and, mm -hmm. and, and I, I parent and my boys too, my boys too. Um, but I, I parent my daughter as if whatever joker come around here in high school and college, I'm setting a standard so high for her that she's going to look like she's going to look at any guy who tries to come to her and she, <laughs> she's going to be like, uh, -uh like, you don't treat me like daddy do. So that's a no. That's a no for me because I'm lowering my standards to 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 take your last name. Like, pause for a second. I'm taking your last name and I have to relinquish the last name of my daddies who treated me better than you. Like, that's the standard that people should have when their daddies should have when they're parenting their daughters. But so much we don't have that. We just feel like we have to be the financial contribution. But no, we have to set the standards of fathers to learn, to know how to parent our children that way. Absolutely. And, you know, now that I'm it's been almost 20 years since I came to the Lord and repented of homosexuality and started down a healing journey. And now I can see that in so much my own journey of, of father wounds. And I never want to blame my dad for my sin. It's like I eventually made choices that I will answer to God for. But now as God has illuminated those areas of my heart and give me more understanding of where I was at, I seen those voids of an emotional connection. And I'm sure some of that was my own fallenness and the you know, sometimes as a child, we misperceive things because we don't have the maturity to uh, see everything accurately. But now I can look back and see that I was misperceiving things, how there's some emotional voids there, yep. some rejection, some hurt and some pain. And I desperately wanted to be loved by a man and to bridge that gap. And so I would look at men like with so much intrigue because mm -hmm. I didn't quite feel like I was one of them. But I was intrigued by them because I wanted whatever it was that they had. Yeah. And so, you know, then puberty hits and some of those emotional desires become sexual desires mm -hmm. and then just one step after another and one choice after another and it snowballs to uh, develop into your identity in your entire life yep absolutely and that's the reason why parents set should be like a halo when it comes to that because i love i i my my wife is a different touch than my daughter is right and my and, and they both know that you know what I mean? and, and so mm -hmm. but at the same time it's it's like there's more of a an eros type of love when it comes to my wife but there's more of a uh, a storge you know or family type of love when it comes mm -hmm. to my daughter but at the same time i still set that boundary of there's no hug that's going to be like daddy's hug until he has a ring on his mm -hmm. finger <laughs> until until mm -hmm. he have a ring on that finger right mm -hmm. uh and so i'm setting the tone of what that storge type of type of familial touch should be because that's going to create, you know, prayerfully a halo of I'm not going to let Eros come too early, right? I'm not going to let that intimacy come too early because I'm protected by the family type of touch and love that my daddy gave to me. So I'm not even going to look for Eros in that way too early because Daddy, you know, is going to be with me and to, and he's going to walk me in the aisle, right? He's going to give me away, you know, to 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 my husband, and like that's where I told my all my kids. I said, you know, I'm fine if you start getting, you know, my two boys, boy, uh, my two boys. I'm cool if y'all start getting girlfriends in, in in high school. I'm I'm cool if if my daughter start getting a boyfriend in high school, but I, you know, the 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 philosophy and and the rules are. When y'all going out to on a date, we're going out on a date, right? And so <laughs> it's that it's that it's that ability to still have that connection with them, not as necessarily helicopter parents, but still setting the tone and setting that example of my wife and I laughing and joking and, and just just really having just really experiencing and enjoying that bond time, and knowing that I, it doesn't have to be sexual to be exciting or, or pleasurable right and so when y'all joking around at, at y'all's table we're gonna sit back a little bit and a few tables over there but we're gonna be here you're gonna be gonna make sure mm -hmm. but at the same time 
that's protecting my daughter, right? That's that's mm-hmm. making sure that my daughter still have daddy's protection. And and that's the beauty of us when it comes to Christ. He lets us do things, you know, we we have the will to do these things, but he's always with us and he has that protection. The more we cling to him, the more we don't have to be distracted by other things that could veer us off from that type of protection um, that only he can give us. And and in a, in a marital standpoint, you know, there I, I'm a protector of my daughter. And then, you know, I'm giving that to her husband to assume that role now as protector and provider. Absolutely. That's that's such great parenting advice and philosophy. What's some of your f- specific philosophies in raising sons who uh, will be under your guidance and leadership in your home, respect you, and will love a woman well? Obviously, you model that. But what's uh, some of the specific um, philosophies on how you engage with your sons to um, raise them to be the men that God would have them to be? Yeah, so it starts with understanding that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, uh, understanding worth in yourself. Same thing with my daughter, uh, but, but with my sons, um, you have to, again, I, I say this to my my sons and my daughter. I say this to my clients, too. When it comes to marriage, the, 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 the wife-to-be is literally saying, like in their mind, <clears throat> what your mindset should be, you better be so good that I'm willing to relinquish my last name for, right? That's a big deal. Like, Mm -hmm. like women have to relinquish their last names for these dudes, right? So especially when you have a close family unit and you've bonded as a family, I I can see for someone who's like, Oh, I'll relinquish my last name. I want nothing to do with those people, but not when you've, been raised as a close family unit that has a deep level of bonding and love for one another. But that goes, you said that you said, you said something really interesting there for the woman who said, I don't mind relinquishing my last name. That's the, that's the issue, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we need to go back to the father and saying, why does she feel this way? She should not feel this way. It should be a very deep, thorough vetting process for her to relinquish her last name to don the the last name of the person. If it's easy, if it's, if it's an easy process and she's like, I'm ready. That is, that is a gap. That is a misstep within the father, because what happens is it shouldn't be easy because what's going to happen is she's going to be a susceptible of having anyone be qualified Mm -hmm. for her to take their last name because she wants to get rid of yours. Right. And so Mm -hmm. when it comes to my boys, uh, basically it's about, it's, it's, it's a way that, okay, are you meeting the standards that God says of, uh, of, of just, just, you know, loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, just, just, you know, just really righteous, moral upstanding views on your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself, having that relationship with your wife to be that's honoring God that makes the, that makes the road like, yeah, I feel safe with taking your last name. Because, mm-hmm. because I know that taking your last name is a decision, is a lifelong decision, and is a decision that I will never regret because you made the process a lot easier for me, especially coming from a really, really good uh, uh, family dynamic. Yeah. And I think the key word you said there was that she feels safe and she can feel safe when his life is surrendered to Jesus and he's willing to lay down his life for her, not in this relationship for what can you do for me? What can I get from you? Which is so much what relationships are built on these days. There's like business transaction of, I, I want this person to make me feel this certain way. I want to take something from them Mm -hmm. instead of what can I give from them? And I have everything I need in Jesus. Therefore I can love my wife unconditionally and that there's a, a massive amount of safety in that. Yep. Because the heart of a spouse should be of a servant, 
right? And so just like Jesus uh, was an amazing uh, uh, shepherd leader, right? He was a, he's a, he was amazing servant leader. He was, I mean, he made, he, he blew servant leadership out the water. You know what I mean? Like with washing the feet of his disciples and, and doing those things and saying, you know what? I, uh, am, am not so haughty and, 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 uh, non-humble and, and so prideful that I feel like I'm, all the way up here and y'all are just these peasants. No, I'm going to dine with you. I'm going to sup with you. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to do those things to make you realize that you're safe with me. You're safe here, right? And when it comes to spouses, it's sacrificial, just like, you know, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, right? Jesus is death, burial, and resurrection really creates an amazing template for marriage. It's dying to self. Uh, it's, it's, it's burying, uh, things that are selfish and, and, and it's all about being, uh, all about you and, and those elements. And it's just resurrecting, uh, a, a God honoring covenant together. You know what I mean? Because just like a husband and wife, you know, the Bible compares that to Jesus and his bride, which is the church. Right. And so that is a uh, that's that shouldn't be taken lightly. (laughs) That that shouldn't be taken lightly at all. Right. And so and so the the husband to be should make it should realize that this is serious stuff here. And even even Peter, you know, he when he wrote to the early church uh, in his letters, you know, he was talking about uh, many things. He was talking about the, the government structure and he was talking about marriage uh, and things like that, and ministry. But in this marriage piece, you know, the context of that hermeneutically, you were dealing with a society that was very uh, against a monotheistic Jesus, right? And so what Peter did to separate, to continue to consecrate the the young Christians uh, at that time, that was that was the crowd that he was writing to initially, is he set the template of this is how sacrifice looks like to honor God in this type of relationship. I'm going to talk about a relationship with the workplace and 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 those types of things, but in the marriage space, this is how that looks like. That's the reason why it's important for wives to submit to your husbands uh, and and win him over with your lifestyle or manner of conversation. That's why it's important to for honors to, to for 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 uh, men to honor their wives. Because if they don't, guess what the word says? Your prayers will be hindered, right? So, mm-hmm. so that that's how serious God gave Peter uh, the inspiration, the Theodostas, uh, to write that to that community at that time. Because it's definitely not a relationship or a covenant that should be taken lightly. That's that's some great words on marriage. I I see so many times and I there's always red flags that go up when I see a church or a Christian community talk so much about wives submitting but they rarely talk about Ephesians 5:25 which is husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. Yes. And so absolutely. we always see that being so lopsided and yeah. that is an extremely high calling that takes a submission to the Lord and a uh death of self. And I'll tell and, and, and quickly, you know, wrapping that up, uh, I, I do want to share this. I, I, I was I was having couples therapy. I love doing couples therapy. That's one of my biggest passions as a therapist. I do all types, but I love doing couples therapy. Um, I was talking to uh, a couple's um, couple clients today, and I was explaining how how crazy it is that we've we've live in a society with so much of propagating, especially, unfortunately, it's been influenced by a lot of Christians too, that man should submit to woman. Mm. And that is not biblical. Like that, that, that is not a biblical construct. Wives should submit to husbands, not women submit to men. You know what I mean? And so a lot mm, of a, yes. a lot of times what happens is we create a construct of of men just thinking that women should just submit to them. 
and that and, and that's an issue and that and that all yes. times comes from uh, uh husbands in the in, in the a lack of husbandry and a lack of husband observation in the in the home to see that there is a submission there's there's a mutual submission in many ways if i know mm-hmm. that you know this thing i mean if you talk about ephesians 5 that's it talks about mutual mutual submission submission yes and, and so uh you know if i know that you're better in finances than me. I'm not going to be saying, well, let me step in and let me let me do this in the spreadsheet. No, no, no. You need to mutually submit. If I know that you're more skilled in this and I know that you're more, if you have a better skill set here, if I know that you are furthering your faith to me when it comes to handling situations like, uh, 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 you know, messed up, you know, collectors are, are, are calling me and it's, it's the, it's the wrong collector or, or I'm trying mm-hmm. to, this it's something, there was an error in my bank or something like that. And I know that, you know, I'm not at, at, at my, uh, in, in my space right now, the self-control is not as good. So I'm going to mm-hmm. submit to my wife who has a better level mm-hmm. of self-control and mm-hmm. let her handle the phone call. Those are the type of things when it comes to mutual submission. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, like a, a, a leadership type of thing, yes, there, that's that type of submission when it comes to wives and husbands. But there's Absolutely. other elements that, you know, um, that we should b- be less prideful and submit mutually in. Like, I, I'm a very relaxed, chill stoic person, you know, of course I don't bat a thousand, but I used to have really bad anger problems. So God completely flipped that over and made me just chill all the time. I'm just a very chill person. So my wife leans to me a lot. Like I'm her therapist all the time. You know what I mean? That I, I just caught, I'm like, I'm the one who's saying, okay, baby, it's going to be okay. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, she's the one who handles, handles the finances because one, I don't have the time to do it. Neither do I have the passion and I don't, I don't feel like it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, it's like I used to play spades a lot and there was a, uh, a saying, uh, you know, i make them, you rake them. Right. And so, I mean, look, i make the money, <laughs> you handle everything else. You know what <laughs> I mean? And so I'm submitting yes. to her in that space and that's okay. You know? And you should both be working on common goals and be on the same page and yep. where you're the big picture of how you're going to handle money in your household and what your values are and what you're working towards. But then it's completely okay to say that, yeah, you have these skill sets and I don't. And so I'm going to rely on you. I, I really, really like that. And I think that's, that's valuable in, in mutual, in an aspect of mutual submission. Yeah. And when, and when kids see that, then they'll realize that they don't have to know everything or they don't have to have this type of know-it-all mentality, especially when men who oftentimes are, don't really do a good job expressing that there's a, a, a an issue or a problem that they have. They just feel like they always have to tough it up. And that's another mm-hmm. thing that they always get from uh, uh, growing up, tough it up, you know, don't, um, don't show your emotions, don't cry, don't do none of that. So they have to one tough it up and then they can't let someone see them sweat. And then they can't, they can't have a space to make mistakes and, and be wrong at something, mm-hmm. right? So you have all yeah. these dynamics and all these factors and a lot of these boys becoming men. And that's the reason why they oftentimes, going back to what I talked about with displacement, they get upset about something and then they start to, uh, and also reaction formation, they start to treat women in a certain way because of a physical power dynamic. And that's the issue that we've seen in society. And that's why we are all equal in God's hands. There's a dynamic when it comes to why uh, husbands and wives, but we should all love each other equally in God's Absolutely. I was just telling someone the other day about, uh, you know, people were complaining that, oh, we're, we're raising such weak men in this culture. And it's like, there's some aspects that I, I agree with. It's like, I grew up in a culture in the Midwest where your boys aren't allowed to cry or show any emotion. And they were, they grew up to be strong men, but they definitely weren't healthy men, right. you know? Right. Uh, and so a strong does not always mean healthy. Yes. You know, we, we can look at an example of King David where he was a warrior. Mm-hmm. He was obviously a strong man, and yet he would weep before the Lord and 
uh, you know, poured out his heart and obviously had a depth to his emotions. Mm -hmm. And those two things aren't mutually exclusive. And when we know Jesus, we should be growing in all of those areas as a warrior to protect our families and our communities and those around us, and yet still have a soft, tender heart in which we could be emotional and emotionally engage in others. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, David got to the point of not even wanting to live anymore. You know what I mean? Like he cried to God and even having that type of, uh, you know, relationship with him and not even wanting to to be here on earth and and just having that moment, that vulnerable weakness and that, and that moment is, is really important for, even for Christian men to see. You know, to have that vulnerable moment with God and God sends, you know, people who love Jesus and are skilled to handle psych psychological, you know, and cognitive, you know, skill sets and have that skill sets to, to, to navigate you through those feelings and therapists as myself. So there's your cheap plug for for myself for the mm. night. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I love it. So, well, Chris, we, we're really running out of time and I could talk to you all day. You are full of so much wisdom and uh, humor and grace and uh, uh, so much that we could. So we'll just have to have you on again sometime. But um, I, I, I do want to point people to your YouTube channel. Your YouTube channel is Dr. Chris Featherstone, PhD. That's the, the title. Talk about theology, psychology, and true crime. Yep. And what a fascinating combination. I love someone who has that combination of skills because we don't see that uh, very often, that, that understanding um, that can really speak into culture and what's going on in our culture. And so do you have anything to add to that? How can people connect with you? Any big uh, revelation, some big piece of wisdom that everyone needs to know as they navigate this world around us? This right here, Jesus is enough. And uh, mm, you know, awesome. The more you the more you believe that, the more you realize that uh, <laughs> seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. Absolutely. Amen. That's a great place to end it. We will link your YouTube and the show notes here so that people can find that and encourage people to check it out. Uh, thank you so much for everyone for joining us on this episode of Calibrate Conversations. Make sure you check out calibrateministries.com. Find more resources, podcast episodes. Uh, check out our parents' ministry if you have children who are struggling. Uh, more podcast episodes. Check out how you can support the ministry. We appreciate that too. Calibrate Ministries com and we pray that you can embrace god's standard for your sexuality because god's grace is sufficient all right have a great night everyone so long.